All right, everyone, we've got a brand new big box. This is Rain and Reverie, and this is a really nice attempt at uh, bringing new players into the game and just getting people like re energized into it. I mean, we had the core, we had the rotation and core two, and that spoke to, put a, gave us a big spike in new, in, new, renewed interest in Netrunner. And I, having the Katara cycle and then topping it off with this box that has a little bit of every faction, something for everybody, it's clearly a really good marketing play for just renewed interest in the game and getting new people into the game and I just I just like to think about what the what the meeting with Boggs and Damon was like when they discussed this. Jane, you go outside, do your thing and bring him in. I'll shake my little Benedict. Bum, bum, bum. No, 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 don't don't do that. Just, no, I'm no, a little no. tiger. Jane, don't I'm do a that. sexy little tiger. No, no, don't do that. Yeah. Please, no. Shake, just shake, get shake. customers. Or at least that's the joke I was going to make. Before, well, you know, the announcement. And the following fan reaction to that. Ah, fight me! But nonetheless, we have a new big box to go through, and we've got a lot of exciting things to cover, and we got a, just just a whole bunch of things to be happy about so let's fo let's focus on this great new product that we have in front of us and let's enjoy my final review of new cards and just just to be clear here I'm going to try to be a little briefer than I normally am on each card because I don't want this video to be like 87 hours long so let's get started okay let's start off this box with the new anarch ID Nathaniel Nat Hall. He is a zero link 4015. When your turn begins, gain a credit if you have two or fewer cards in your grip. So right off the bat, uh, we have Gary Coleman as an identity. And that's just funny to me. Uh, he's the first 40 card deck size that Anarch has ever had. And we'll see how that turns out. The ability and play style of Nat is very, very anarch. It's like, dump your crap, don't give a crap, run everything, gain money for being risky and dangerous, and, you know, just throwing caution into the wind. It's a very aggressive, very anarch play style to get rewarded for taking risks. Now, one thing about Nat, though, is that you he might be a lot harder to play than you think, because consistently, consistently having two or less cards in your hand for the most of the, for most of the game is harder than it sounds. Because that means every time you draw cards, you then have to immediately use those cards. And one of the uh, advantages to having the bin breakers, the, cons the Omar conspiracy breakers, is that you can overdraw and chuck them. So this kind of goes completely against that. So, yeah, but then again, we're seeing cards later on that, you know, he may not want to use the bin breakers after all. So a, a credit now, if you can get this off, just passive credit a turn is really nice. Like, you know, we've, we've all seen ETF. We've all seen Asmari and Polana. We, we all know the value of IDs that let you drip money over the entire course of the game. They are always strong impactful IDs. I don't I yeah, I don't I, other than like Corset Wayland, I don't think there's been a single ID that gets you money that hasn't been relevant, that hasn't been distinctly relevant at some point. So there's there's definite there's definitely power in gaining credit every turn. It's just you have to play a very specific way. And if you can do that, this will give you a lot of power. Of course, let's all be let's all be honest. One thing you absolutely must have in mind when playing Nat is that you absolutely freaking have to have damage prevention in your deck. This is a 40 card, 40 card deck that will get completely steamrolled by anything remotely damage related if you do not have lots of damage prevention in your deck. And if you like if you're just feeding all that Nathaniel drip into a feedback filter throughout the entire game, that's 
you know, doesn't really feel that great. Now there is that, uh, what was it called? The Noble Path, or the thing where you could make a run and not take any damage, but you still get, you can still get neurally impede or punitive counter strike after that. So I think I think that's if you're gonna play if you're gonna play Nat, I'm sure he's really cool and really fun. Uh, but you if you're gonna play him, you need to make sure that you have substantial damage protection. Otherwise, you, otherwise you just you just lose to anything remotely damage related. And right after Nat, we've got Divide and Conquer. This is a three to play, four influence run event, and it says make a run on archives. If successful, after accessing archives, access one card from HQ, then access the top card of R and D. And wow, this is this is solid. This is not bad at all. And what this I think what this is really supposed to be is like this is Anarch, you know, finally uh, getting their equivalent of legwork. Or Maker's Eye. That's really, really, really what this feels like. This is the this is the anarch equivalent of Lake Worker Maker's Eye, and it's not bad. It's not bad at all. I mean, it's not as it's not as obviously useful as those other two cards are that allow you to dig really deep into one server. This gets you a little bit of everything, but I could see like one or two copies of this getting slotted into decks because like look think of those times when you just poke archives just to see what all the cards in it are. Or if you're doing that just to like build up turtle counters or something, this also gets you two extra accesses off HQ and R and D. Like that's that's like po poking archives, finding an agenda they tossed into archives, and also stealing one out of their hand or their deck has got to feel really good. Or you could also, I think you could also combo it with the turning wheel. I believe this still works with the turning wheels. You could run archives, hit one of hit the other two servers, and still. Uh, dig super deep on one of those other two, so it's it's definitely it's definitely got some usage. I don't you're you're not going to see it as often as legwork or maker's eye, but I think it does have some solid use, and there there this card can definitely have some really nice plays you can do with it. So I'm I'm very I'm very glad to see this. All right, next we've got guinea pig. This is a three influence, four to play event. It says trash your grip and gain 10 bucks. And thematically, this is a very conflicting card because like throwing away your entire hand for a big pile of money now is very, very thematically anarch. But at the same time, uh, submitting yourself to the man and being an experimental guinea pig is also extremely, extremely not anarch. So flavor-wise, it's like a really conflicting card. But other than that, this is a net gain of six credits up front, which uh, is going to be really freaking good. Uh, I don't, like, you can use this with bin breakers. You can use this as kind of a pseudo stim hack. And there's a, a judge, judging by the ruling on how uh, audacity works where it does count itself for attraction cards from your hand you should be able to play this when it's the only card in your hand probably but which make which makes it even better now obviously this is meant specifically for nat and goes perfectly with his play style but it also just is a pretty solid anarch card in general i mean any any deck that was playing day job will probably gladly swap that for this I mean, it's 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 burst. It's it's a, it's a, kind of like a spinoff of Stim Hack. It's burst money at a cost. Like, it's good. So some people might swap their Stim Hacks for this. Some people might run both. It's like I don't know what else to say. It's a very very anarch econ card. Then right after Guinea Pig, we've got a card that works extremely well with it. This is Patchwork. Uh, this is four to four to play, three influence, console plus one MU. Once per turn, when you would play or install a card, you may trash a card from your grip to lower the player install cost by two. And this is the rare thing of a kind of kind of like Spinal Modem or Desperado, where this is a console that is an econ source. And in Anarch, this is a pretty solid thing. This obviously works outrageously well with uh, the bit with the conspiracy breakers, like 
you ch you chuck a paper clip in the bin and then you can you know play your sure gambles for three instead of five or you can you know or you can play your guinea pigs and gain eight instead of six and just I mean what else do we tell like any anything that you would play or install you can chuck a conspiracy breaker and make it two credits cheaper you know or other copies of patchwork or anything else you don't happen to need at the time this could this easily that this works really well with nat because it helps you thin your hand out really fast and the the basic the the ideal two credits a turn from this plus the ideal one credit a turn from nat himself could make a very efficient uh, e econ engine which is really weird for anarch to have but yeah it's it's a, it's definitely it's a solid console there is there is not a there is not a damn thing not to like about this console. The only thing with it, uh, about whether or not you'll actually see it around outside of Nat himself, is that Anarch has so many console options that are so good. Like this, this is this is a this is a good solid respectable card. It's just that it has so much competition. Like, do you go with Maw? Do you go with Turntable? Do you go with you know any of the other? any of the really good anarch consoles so yeah but this this has this has easily the potential to get you a buttload of economy over the course of the game then we've got a new hardware this is hijacked router to influence two to play it's unique whenever the corp creates a server they lose a credit when whenever you make a successful run on archives you may trash it to force the corp to lose three credits. So this is very clearly an anti-asset spam card. And you know, one of the things Boggs has been doing is definitely giving the runners more tools to deal with asset spam. And this is one of them. So it's 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 literally a reverse turtlebacks. That's what this is. This is literally a reverse turtlebacks. And then when you run archives, you can pop it and make the Corp lose an additional three, so that's. I mean, if you're if you want a card to help you against asset spam matchups, this will definitely help. Uh, it's unique, but you can still install one, pop it, install the next one, go pop that, and keep keep going. Now, this is it worth using just for the run archives and make the corp lose three? I definitely wouldn't say so, especially if you want if you want that, just use mining accident. But uh, this is this is a this is a nice little, the nice little card for helping you deal with asset spam. So now you know you're in Anarch, though. Do you run this or Salsit Slums or Scrubber to help deal with asset spam? I guess take your pick. But as Bog Boggs has made very certain that runners have access to ample tools to help deal with asset spam, which is good. Then in the still continuing line of fixed versions of broken older cards, we have Cradle which is the new Yogg. It's four to play, one MU, three influence, it's decoder, five strength, but it has minus one strength for every card in your hand. Then two credits break any number of code gate subroutines. All right, so before I go any further, my friend insists that I do this joke. Hey, hey, kakatta na? <laughs> and if you didn't get that, well, you don't watch JoJo, and frankly, that's just your fault. So, anyway, uh, this is actually not a bad card. I mean, the clear ability to have five strength and two credits break any number of subs in the ideal situation is extremely good. But remember, in order for that to happen, you have to have literally nothing in your hand. And outside of using the previously shown guinea pig, there's not a lot of ways to consistently do that, especially right now with how much zero is going around everywhere. So you can't really put this in a zero deck. I don't think, I don't really think we're going to see this outside of Nat unless people start playing it with a bunch of like old school like data sucker ice carver support kind of things which is possible uh it is it is definitely a more balanced version of yog 
And it's not a bad card. I just think if you're going to use Cradle, I think you have to put an awful lot of support into your deck to make sure it works. Because if you if you get locked out with this, you get locked out. And eating DNA tracker sucks. So yeah. And last for the Anarch cards, we have District 99. So this is a unique 3 influence, 3 to install resource. It says, the first time each turn a program or a piece of hardware is trashed from any location, you may place a power counter on it. Click three counters, add a card that matches the faction of your identity from your heap to your grip. So this is something that is meant to be like when you're, when you're injecting through your heat breakers or you're zeroing and chucking stuff away that this will eventually allow you to get some recursion back after that. I do very much like the idea that it has to match your faction. That, I think that's supposed to be a measure that kind of helps you from abusing recurring things that you've splashed into your deck. I think that's a nifty way to do that. But the, the idea is that as you go through your deck, trashing your stuff, you know, particularly injecting through your heat breakers, that this eventually gets you some recursion to get something important back, like a liberated, like a liberated accounts, you know, like a wand destruction or what ha or what have you. So is it is it super strong? No, but it could it could be useful. This could this could be surprisingly good if there's some like specific power cards that you really want back. This I could could I could see so I could see this having like a little bit of niche usage. All right, so let's start off the criminal cards. This is Lisa Talking Thunder. It's a zero link 5015 ID. It is a G mod, so that will be relevant later on. Uh, the first time you make a successful run on a central server each turn, draw two cards and take one tag. So right away, I'm thinking that there are two main ways you would play this ID. Uh, the first one is a Citadel Sanctuary type of build where you use the ability as, you know, a buttload of gas to draw through your deck and then just use Citadel Sanctuary to remove the tag for free. That, you know, could definitely have some value. The other way is to go pure tag me and maybe try to run some kind of, like, counter surveillance God of War type deck out of something like some kind of tag me deck out of... Krim, which is something we have not seen in quite some time. But so which which one of those would be better? I I don't really know. Tag me's not a deck style I have a lot of experience with, but I know that you know there's there's definitely some ways that you can make it really good, especially with an ability like this where you can draw through your deck while taking tags, which is what you know all those you know rogue trading god of war decks really, 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 really want to do. This kind of sort of feels like an attempt at a criminal version of Valencia, because it's a 50-15 with, like with like a tempo effect. You just get cards instead of getting money. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I'm, not, I'm not really sure about this one. Like I, like I said, like I, just, I don't have enough experience with Tag Me style decks to really know how to fully utilize this, but I'm sure somebody does and they will. Just... Just don't get high profile targeted. And then we've got everyone's favorite thing, card games on motorcycles. This is Hot Pursuit. It is a two to play, two influence run event. Make a run on HQ. If successful, gain nine credits and take a tag. And this is pretty crim and pretty solid. I mean, even without any support cards at all, just the raw value from this is basically make a run on HQ, and then gain 5. Because you get a net gain of 7, but you have to remove the tag. It's still like, click run on HQ, click remove the tag, you still gain a net gain of 5 credits, which is not bad. But as soon as you start comboing this with any other form of support, like Citadel Sanctuary, or Paragon, or or playing it, or especially playing it out of Ken Tenma, then the value of this card just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. Like, the, you could you could very well make a deck, probably a Kentenma deck, that is revolved around just abusing the crap out of this card. It is, it is strong, it is fast, 
it's still decent without any without any support with support it can just get silly so this is this is su this is super crim and i love it and someone needs to make a ken tenma deck that just uses every card that has motorcycles in it and this next card is without question the most important crim card in this box and it is paragon or as everyone will call it desperado 2.0 it is 3 to install, 2 influence, plus 1 MU. The first time you make a successful run each turn, you may gain a credit and look at the top card of your deck. If you do, you may add that card to the bottom of your deck. All right, so we all know how this works. I got to have a got to have a clip for this around here somewhere. Let's uh, let's take a look on there. Not open this folder. This one. No. Here, I can, here this one. This one works. I uh, already did this one. Let's, uh, ooh, let's, let's do this one. Yeah! <laughs> there, that's better. And again, just like explaining this is kind of like explaining Diversion of Friends from before, unless you are brand new to the game, I don't have to tell you how good Son of Siphon and Son of Desperado are. If you are new to the game, they're very, very good. They are key integral criminal cards. And in particular, criminals had by far the worst and least playable consoles after rotation. Criminals were really, really, really hurting for a good playable console. And this solves that quite a bit. Now, you do not get quite as much money as Desperado got you because it's you know, not surprisingly once a turn instead of every run, but that other extra effect where you look at your deck and give you that draw filtering, I could easily argue that Paragon is at least as good, maybe even better, than Desperado is, because that draw filtering could have some pretty substantial value throughout the course of the game. Anything you don't need, it doesn't draw you the card, but anything you don't need, you put at the bottom. Which means you, which means you get rid of dead draws, and in a fast, aggressive criminal play style where you want to keep running and drawing and running and drawing and playing run events all the time, dead draws slow down your tempo, and this drastically reduces the amount of dead draws you get. Particularly, and this is my this is my favorite thing about this card, uh, is that particularly other copies of this console and any other like multiple copies of unique cards, which is one thing that's always been an issue with consoles, is you put three in your deck because you want the effect as soon as possible, but you install one and the other two are useless. With this, you install the first one and you basically never see the other two or any other you know multiple copies of unique cards you put down. You install one and because of Paragon, you just never see the other one. You never get those dead draws and that's it's, it's a subtle thing, but it's really, really good for Krim and just good in general. I'm also kind of curious how well Paragon works with uh, Oracle May, because even if you don't put the card at the bottom, you can, you'll can you know what it is, then you can guaranteedly get the Oracle May proc off, which means for two clicks you make a run, draw a card, and gain three credits, which is pretty spiffy. So that's definitely worth experimenting with. Obviously good with Lisa, good with just about every criminal deck in the game. So like it be ready to return to the days of are you a crim? Check yes no. Are you geist? Check net yes no. Run death run desperado aka now paragon. And yeah, we're we're so glad to have you back. Then we've got bankroll and I am very pleasantly surprised with this. Not only do we get Desperado 2.0 we're getting Program Desperado. So this is two influence, one to install, one MU program. Whenever you make a successful run, you may place a credit for the bank on bankroll and trash it, take all credits from bankroll. Now, obviously this is something that's going to take up your MU and it's something that's going uh, to eventually pay off later in the game as you've made a bunch of runs, not something that uh, pays you as you're doing it, like Des like Desperado slash Paragon does. But this does give you a credit 
every time he makes a successful run, just like Desperado used to. And combined with Paragon, this could like th- these two cards combined could very well be strong enough to bring back just a, r- a really strong showing for like old classic run based criminal where you have you know, you had like Desperado and Data Sucker ran things as much as possible. You can could have bank you could have bankroll and Data Sucker and Paragon and make this this makes a really strong case for trying to bring back classic run based criminal. It's it makes a really strong case for that. And like it's it's program desperado. Like there I'm very pleasantly surprised with this. Then we have Criminal's Breaker for this set and I'll tell you what, like I had this weird sneaking suspicion that we were going to get a criminal fractor in Rain and Reverie, so I was like kind of sort of expecting it. And I was half right because we did get a criminal fractor, but I was definitely not expecting this. So this is Tycoon. It is two influence. It is one MU. It is one to install. It is one strength. It says one credit break up to two barrier subs and two credits plus three strength. And those things all sound fan fisking tastic. But then there's this other little chunk of text on the card that says whenever an encounter with a piece of ice in which you use Tycoon to break a subroutine ends, the corp gains two credits. And just what in the world is this? Like, I was so excited when I saw this card for like five seconds because it looked so good and so nice and I was so jazzed up to finally not have to spend three influence on paperclip. But then I read the gain money effect and my heart sank. And because just other, otherwise this is a very nice fractor and that money effect makes it single handedly just makes it completely unplayable. Like completely just useless. Because it's it's not it's not even the first time per turn. It's every time that you use this to break a barrier, the corp gains two credits. If the if the corp has a server of you know vanilla vanilla vanilla, you want to get through that server, the corp gains six credits. Like the amount of money you will feed the corp over the course of the game with this is just just insane. There's there's just it's just it's just dumb. So like the old, the only the only conceivable saving grace I can think of for this is a it is a it is a one to install breaker with pretty good numbers on it. This is something you slap down early because it's really cheap and you want to get in. So you could use you could use like tycoon and paperclip the same way you use like a passport and an abignail or like fairies and a mongoose you use like a real a really dirt cheap uh breaker you can put down and then your quote unquote real breakers will come later when you have more money that i can i can th- i can see as a use for that I mean, between between tycoon and fairy and pay and passport criminal can now install their entire breaker suite for two credits and that's yeah that's pretty that's pretty silly but I would highly recommend getting paperclip on the field, or really not even just paperclip, like basically any fractor in the game other than this down as soon as humanly possible. Like get put put this down just when you need to get in. And you're okay with the corp gaining two credits so that you can steal an agenda or something or whatever. Like that's that's fine, because like or the, or this the other thing the other thing that could save this is that the corp gaining money does feed into tapworm so as long as you have a tapworm out this some of this money will come back to you a little bit uh, is that worth it probably not because for every 3 times this goes off you get one credit back a turn and that's if they're not purging tapworm away but it's something uh, the other thing, though, is that this also works with pad tap, because the corp, ever the corp gains money off this. This is a card effect, so every time, so so when when this goes off, pad tap also goes off, and that does help. Like 
Tap, tapworm is like, okay, I guess it's something. Pad tap does help soften the blow of Tycoon. So now again, pad tap is once per turn. This is every time. And that's really annoying. Like if, if this was if this was even just once per turn, I would be softer to it. But it's every time and that really stings. But tapworm and tapworm and pad tap are good cards and they do soften the blow of the really bad part of Tycoon. I mean, if, you, if you've got two pad taps out, it's like, okay, the corp gains two, I gain two, but I still get in. You know, so like, uh, I, I could see Tycoon being specifically in a Krim deck that is running both Tapworm and Pad Tap, which ironically is something that I am currently working on, like at this very minute. So I could try it in then, but even then, I would not rely on this as your primary fractor. I would, this was even then with pad tap and tap room in your deck, I would still say slap this down early just when you want to get in, but get, get your paper clip out as soon as it's convenient. So yeah, like just, ah, oh, this, this card, this card. Then we've got Thunder Art Gallery. Wow, that is a, that is a card name. Uh, unique, two influence, three to install resource. The first time you avoid or remove a tag each turn, you may install a card from your grip, lowering its install cost by one. So I kind of figured we would get some kind of tag removal sort of card to synergize with things like Blaze's ability and Hot Pursuit. And this is basically that, but it's a little more awkward. This does not help you remove the tags, but it gives you a small reward for removing them or avoiding them. So it could be tempting to use, but I'm not sure how useful it actually is. Because the, 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 well, let's, let's talk about what's, what's the raw economic value of this. It's like, it's normally a click in two credits, to remove a tag. Uh, this gets you, when you do that, you get to install something, lower its cost by one, so you save the install click and the credit. So it's three, so at, at raw value, this is three credits to install, and every time it goes off, it saves you a click and a credit. So this needs to go off like, you know, compare it to a daily cast like four times for it to be worthwhile. And it's given you the value of a daily cast, which is good. Uh, but the issue I'm having with this is that like first you, first you need this, then you need the cards that tag you, then you need the cards that remove tags, then you need the things you want to install. You need all of that and then that still has to go off multiple times. So I think it's just it's it's going to be an unnecessary cog in the puzzle. Uh, but I mean, if if you can get it to work, it does work really well with rogue trading because you take money off rogue trading, take a tag, remove your tag with Citadel Sanctuary or whatever, and then like set up like and then just very easily set up while taking money off rogue trading. But again, like I think if you're going to do that, this is just it's it's an I think it's an unnecessary piece of the puzzle or just. Because you gotta you gotta have this stuff in your hand over and over again, and you really have to combo it with stuff where you take tags without running, which pretty much means rogue trading. Because if you're gonna use it with things like hot pursuit or credit kiting, where you take the tag as a result of a run, it's like you have to have your breakers out, you have to have your other stuff out. It's like you're what's left for you to install. So I mean. It's not bad, but I don't think it's necessary for most of the decks you could put it in. Unless unless you come up with something, some really specific, like, elaborate combo with it, which I suppose is possible. But, again, like, I don't, I, I think your deck slots are probably better spent with just regular raw econ cards. And to finish up, Krim, we've got this new little thing called Miss Bones. And I do not actually know how much influence it is, because I couldn't find a proper spoiler of it, but we've got this little clip here. I'm guessing it's two or three influence, but it is a two to install unique resource, and it says place 12 credits from the bank on Miss Bones when she is installed. When there are no credits left on Miss Bones, trash her. Use these credits to trash installed cards. 
So first of all, I'd just like to point out how the wording refers to the card as her, as opposed to this card or the card or something like that. That's, I mean, does it actually mean anything? No, I just thought that was a weird little thing to point out. I guess it helps for storyline immersion. Uh, but the uh, bottom line of this card is this is Super Scrubber. That's what this is. This is just a straight up improvement to Scrubber, and it's a big improvement. Uh, the You gain a net value of 10 credits. Uh, the one drawback between this versus Scrubber is that you can only spend them on installed cards. You can't spend them on stuff that you find out of R&D or HQ. But in literally every other aspect, this is just way, way better than Scrubber. In order for... Now, Scrubber could eventually give you more money, but it would take seven turns of using Scrubber to surpass Miss Bones. And with her, you can just slap it down and go trash something super obnoxious like a Jeeves model Bioroids or a Mukundu City Grid, or sorry, Mwanza, Mwanza City Grid, or uh, Jinja City Grid, or friggin' Mumbad Virtual Tours. Any, any of those, no, or Chrisium Grid, any, any of those big, fat, obnoxious, like four to five trash things that just sit there on the corpse board and you just stare at them and hate them because they're like one to trash. Sorry, sorry, they're like one to res and like 800,000 credits to trash. And it just drives you nuts. This is an answer to that. And it's pretty good. Like the, fa the fact that you can just slam it down and just go start wiping, just to go start clearing out remotes and, or just slap it down and it's like, hey, I can, that, that whole like uh, Brian Stinson ginger grid server you just got sitting there, it's like now it's just gone. And that's pretty cool. So again, this is another anti-acid spam card or even just, even just anti big fat upgrade card. If you can use this and like kill two ginger grids and it's done its job. So this is this is a huge upgrade to Scrubber. And I'm happy to see it. So that's what I've been saying about most of the Crim cards here. All right, for the Shaper ID, we've got Akiko Nisei. This is a one link 4512. It says whenever you access cards from R&D, you spend, play a side game. Uh, if you and the corpse spend the same number of credits, access one additional card from R&D. Okay, so first of all, right off the bat, who at FFG has been force-feeding all the Shaper chicks the pretty pills? Because I swear, just every set, it's just... Fine, 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 fine! That aside, this looks like a really cool and fun ID to play. I mean, obviously, the runner having side games to play to mess with the corp is not something we've really had before, save for that one card nobody played. Uh, but what a lot of people will account this as is that you just bid zero every time you run R&D and you force the corp to pay a credit every turn. Every turn that you hit R&D, you force the corp to pay an extra credit to keep you from accessing more. And it probably is possible to run some kind of econ denial plan like that, where you just try to get into R&D as much as possible to drain the corpse credits. But Shaper isn't really known for being able to do that consistently, like not to do that, like not to hit R&D enough times. That's going to be worth it, especially when the corpse sees you playing this and they just start slamming ice in front of R&D as soon as as much as they can. I think uh, just playing it like the straight-up side game it is to actually get extra accesses is probably the better way to do it. Because uh, this, is this essentially says that uh, you have a 1 in 3 chance of getting an extra access. Uh, there is that one current, however, that says the corp can't bid 2. You know, so that can increase your odds as well. Or they can also just keep you know, start off bidding zero over and over again, costing the court money and training them on zero, then basically whenever you want, you can pay you can pay the one and get extra accesses. I mean this is this is a lot of really good uses. Equivocation is obviously really, really good with her. Because if you can if you can get into R and D multiple times, you can dig super hard. And it's it's just 
it's a nice, solid, cool ID, and I'm sure a lot of people have fun with it. Uh, the one link is nice. The minus three influence, though, really hurts her. Like, the minus three influence really hurts. But I'm sure there's still some pretty fun stuff you can get away with with her. So, yeah, she's, she's pretty cool. Welcome addition. Uh, then we've got a pretty interesting new event for Shaper. This is Insight. It's a double, it's zero to play, it's two influence, and it says the corp may look at the top four cards of R&D and arrange them in any order. You then reveal the top four cards of R&D. And this is a really interesting card that's kind of difficult to really evaluate. Because the, the corp gets to arrange the top four cards, but then you get to see, after that, you get to see whatever they arranged. And I think the big comparison to make here is with indexing, where indexing is the runner gets to look at the top five cards, arrange them however they want, and then it's usually paired by running back in again and stealing whatever agenda they put at the top. This is more like an indexing that only requires one run, because, like, you play it, you know, the corp obviously isn't going to put their agendas right on top, but then when you reveal, you know exactly where the agenda is, and that's still really powerful. So if you can, if you can combo this up, you know, assuming they put it right at the bottom, you can still combo this up with something like equivocation or Nisei's ability or uh, Maker's Eye, anything like that. And, or, or just sit there and know where, exactly where the agenda is, because you, 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 can, you can wait until the agenda is at the top of the deck, which then requires counterplay of the corp trying to draw to break the R&D lock, but then you know the agenda is in their hand. So there's, I don't know, like it's, it's, def, it's definitely useful, it definitely involves a lot of interaction between the corp and the runner, and a lot of like counterplay mind games, and that's really cool. Uh, I don't know if you would play this over indexing? Probably not, but maybe there's some value to having both and just like having ridiculous control over knowing what the corp has coming for most of the game. Like that that could have, running both of these could have value. So it's, it's, it's tricky to evaluate this one, but it's it's definitely it's definitely an interesting card to play, to play around with. Okay, then we've got Mind's Eye. This is a 3-to-play, three 3-influence three console. It's plus 1 MU. Whenever you make a successful run on R&D, you may place one power counter on it. Click three hosted power counters. Access the top card of R&D. And straight up, this is my favorite Shaper console. Period. Hands down. This is, this is my favorite Shaper console. I love the effect. I love that it's a Rubik's Cube. I love the artwork. It's... I love that it's run based. It's just mm, this 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 is hands down my favorite shaper console. It just it just is. Obviously, it works well with Akiko's ability, or it works really well with. Uh, it doesn't actually work with equivocation because that's off a, that's off a successful run. But I believe it still works with Niashia, so you could still use this and and access two cards. And it's just yeah, like this is. This is this is really cool. This is really solid. It rewards uh, running. It rewards, you know, aggression, and it gives you a very suitable reward for it. And it's a freaking Rubik's cube. So, yeah, Anarch, or, not Anarch, uh, Shaper has had lots and lots of consoles to mess with over the years. Although a lot of them have kind of just been de facto turned into Astrolabe, but this one is definitely strong enough to break that mold. So this is this is this is totally the, the power this gives you is totally worth considering even if you were just like you know default swapping astro, putting astrolabes in your deck it might very well be worth swapping for this or yeah this is this is this is a very very cool console and next up is mache like paper mache this is a three influence one to install unique hardware. It says, the first time you trash an accessed card each turn, you may place power counters on Mache equal to that card's trash cost. Three hosted power counters draw one card. So again, what Boggs has done is give each runner faction a tool to help them deal with asset spam. 
this is this is Shaper's tool to help do tacit spam. So like uh, Anarch got the hijacked router, Criminal got Miss Bones, and Shaper gets Mache. And of those three cards, I definitely got to say Miss Bones is the best. Uh, Mache, and that Mache is probably the worst. Like you, you spend you spend a deck slot on this, you spend six credits trashing stuff. So you spend seven credits because you had to install this too. So you spend an extra click and seven credits, and then your reward is that you get to draw two cards. Like that's not even close to worth it. Like this is, you know, I guess I guess if you were in like a Mopus deck or something, this gets you. This helps get you like some kind of tempo, so you can draw cards while just sitting there, Mopus clicking and camping assets over and over again. I guess that it does have some kind of value there. You can still maintain your draw tempo while mopusing through assets, but outside of that specific scenario, it's it's just not worth it. Like spend it's, it, it really isn't. Like the amount of the amount of money you have to spend to get payback on this is just is just not enough. So I'm not not a big fan of this one. Then we've got our last icebreaker for the pack, and this is definitely the weirdest. This is Ika. It's two influence. It's a killer. It's zero to install, one MU, two strength. It has two credits hosted on a piece of ice. One credit break up to two subroutines on the host ice, and two credits plus three strength. And I am just really not sure how to feel about this card. This is this is so weird. Like it feels like this shaper version of like a really awkward combination of fairy and mongoose. Like I really don't know how to feel with this. This is such an awkward card to use. Now, uh, zero to install, two starting strength, really nice uh, boost and break numbers are pretty are pretty great. You know, this can break a non C for four credits, but it's that two credits to host it on a piece of ice that I think is going to catch a lot of people by surprise when they try to use it. Like that, that it's zero to install, but that two credits to swap it on something will add up really, really fast. Now you can uh, use it on one piece of ice, keep going, then when you see the next sentry, stick it onto the next sentry mid-run, so you don't have to worry about having more than one of these out, but you do have to worry about the corp installing over that piece of ice and blowing up your killer along with it. So I think if you if you play this, you really need to go out of your way for it. You need to play like reclaims or clone chips. You need to play more than one copy of this. And you really need to play something like a cyber feeder or a multi-threader in order to eat that two to two to in two to host cost because that is really what's hold if anything holds it back it's that because that is going to add up really really fast. So now if if you jump through those hoops like play multiples of these, play clone ship or whatever, and play some multi-threaders. Is it worth it? Well, it might. Well, it might be. I mean, clone ship certainly has other uses, and multi-threader is still multi-threader, so maybe it would be worth toying around with. But this is this is just so awkward. Next up is Cuban which is a 1 influence, 0 to install, 1 MU program. Install it on a piece of ice and gain 2 credits whenever you pass that piece of ice. And this is another, like, cute little card. Like, I think, I think between this and Psych Mike, uh, they are trying to give Shaper, specifically Akiko, the tools to you know, be able to consistently run R and D over and over again to get her ability off, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, you're will now will the corp trash a piece of ice that this is hosted on in order to keep you from gaining two credits every time you go through it? If it's like a vanilla or something, yeah, they absolutely will. But if it's something big, I seriously doubt it. Like, are they are they going to trash you know a Fairchild three because you're getting essentially a two credit discount when every time you go through it? Probably not. So this is this could be this could get you a surprising amount of money 
throughout the course of the game. There's also the fact that it's only one influence, which kind of makes me want to run it in Crim, because that's that's definitely early pressure, that's run-based economy. At one influence, this is this could very this could very well get splashed into Crim, and I'd be interested to see that. Then last for Shaper, we've got this cute little card. This is Psych Mike. A one to play unique four influence resource. The first time a successful run on R&D ends each turn, you may gain one credit for each card you accessed from R&D. So it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it works well with Akiko, obviously, because you get your money back for your Psy games, or you gain a little bit of profit while draining the corp a little bit of money. It's not bad in general in other decks, like it, anything, anytime you're running uh, deep data mining or Maker's Eye instead of indexing, this works pretty well. Uh, obviously, it doesn't, doesn't work so well with index and doesn't work so well with equivocation, but other more traditional forms of multi-axis it works really well with. And if you get this down early, it could add up fairly well. So, yeah, it's just, it's just a cute little card. I like it. All right, then to start the mini factions, we've got Adam's card, Algernon. This is a... 5 influence, unique, 0 to install, 1MU program. When your turn begins, you may pay 2 credits to gain a click. If you do, trash this when your turn ends if you did not make a successful run this turn. And this is kind of a weird card. Uh, it's definitely not bad, but l l let's be real, we already have a 0 to install Tempo program that's actually an Atom card that's way better than this, and that's RNG key. But this is still not bad. Paying two credits to gain a click, if you try to use this to just gain a bajillion extra clicks, it's going to drain your money way too fast. Uh, it does. I think I think the point of this is it's supposed to sync, help synchronize with Always Be Running, because the uh, that's obviously by far and away the least popular Atom directive right now. So I think this is supposed to help synergize with that, or just help you get extra clicks when you happen to want it, like against Bioroids, or if you just have extra stuff you want to do this turn. Uh, still, I don't, I don't think a lot of people are going to take this, mostly just because they're going to go with RNG key instead. But there might be some niche situations where this is really nice, or people might figure out ways to abuse this with Find the Truth. So then we've got our apex card and it's reboot it's a five influence one to play run event it says make a run on archives if successful instead of accessing cards install up to five cards from your heap face down remove reboot from the game instead of trashing it and on its face this card doesn't really make any sense like what reason would apex ever have to use this under normal circumstances? And the answer is basically none. Uh, however, as we all know, the optimal way to play Apex these days is to play uh, Aesop's Pawn Shop Apex. And the thing is, because you're running Aesop's Pawn Shop and spending your restricted card on that, you can't run Levy. So one of the ways to beat that deck is to just wait till it runs out of cards in its deck, which, as PU, is just thematically fantastic to watch, as you just watch Apex literally devour himself through Heartbeat, trying to prevent all your damage till there's nothing left. Like, it's just, hmm, thematically fantastic to watch that. But because, but because you can't play Levy you will eventually run out of gas. So this, you, could, you could slot probably one or two copies of Reboot into a Pawn Shop Apex deck just to help stave that off for like five more turns, which is not bad, not a bad thing. Uh, it keeps you from running out of gas for a while longer. So it might, it might be more useful than you think, at least in a <clears throat> competitive Apex deck. Oh, God, that hurts to say. Uh, but outside of running Pawn Shop Apex, I really don't know what this is for. So Then for Sunny, we'd have what is 
surely going to be the most relevant of the three mini faction cards in this box, and that's Office Supplies. It is three influence, it's four to play, and it says reduce the cost of it by one for every link you have, gain four credits, or draw four cards. And let's be real, the gain four credits might as well not even be printed on the card. This is draw four cards for Sunny, and that's pretty substantial. Like even if, even with just her bare bones starting two link, it's pay to draw four, which is not great, but it's certainly not bad. And in Sunny, that's you'll you'll take it. You'll take it every day for not having to spend influence on it. Now, as soon as you put down link cards, though, like even as you put down even a single link card, and this becomes pay one, draw four, or pay zero, draw four, in which case it becomes very, very good. So, yeah, and then just one of the one of bi Sunny's big Sunny's biggest problem. We all know is she's so slow, and just this is draw four in Sunny in faction, and that's re that's gonna this is going to speed her up substantially. Uh, the, yeah, the, the gain four credits might as well not even be printed on the card because like uh, no one else is going to pay three influence for this and Sunny already has so much drip econ and especially with her running the whole like rogue trading power tap combo nonsense like you you don't need the four credits. This is this this is for the draw four cards, and it is absolutely worth that. So, full like, fully expect every single Sunny deck to have a to have a playset of this auto included into their deck because it's worth it. Okay, and for our one neutral runner card, we have one of the first cards spoiled. This is DJ Fenris. It's one influence. It's unique. It's a three to play connection resource. It says, host a Gmod identity that does not match the faction of your identity on it when he is installed. Remove the identity from the game if he is trashed, and he gains the text of the hosted identity, and you can only have one copy of DJ Fenris in your deck. And I'm going to be upfront about this. This is jank. But, at the same time, this is some of the best kind of jank there is. Like... It's, it's not anywhere near consistent enough to like be relied upon. None of the combos that I can think of off the top of my head of who the Gmods are are particularly game-breaking or anything like that. Probably the best one is comboing Geist and Haley. But this does something really, really unique and really, really cool that a lot of people will really love. And for a single influence, I... Not going to be surprised to see a lot of people just chucking it into their deck, deck just for shits and giggles because it's a really fun, nifty, cool card, and it is like it, it is jank. This this is jank. This is not going to change the meta or enable anything dumb. It's just it's just a fun, goofy card. It's not it's not going to you know suddenly elevate uh, certain decks the way re, the way like Valencia rebirthing into Omar does. But this is like some of the best kind of jank that a card game can have. It's so unique, and it's so cool, and it's a really fun thing to do. Yeah, it's... Just go, just go ahead and have fun with it. So let's start up Corpse Side with good old HB. This is their new identity. It is Sports Metal. Sports! 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 Sports, 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 It is a 45-15, and it says, Whenever an agenda is scored or stolen, gain two credits or draw two cards. And this is kind of like another attempt at an HB Rush deck. I mean, there's there's Next Division, and there's ASA Group. This, is, this feels like another attempt at an HB Rush deck, and... Uh, I'd probably put it about on the same levels as those, as those other two. It does it does things in a different way, but they both they both give you a reasonable amount of of tempo as you as you go through and do things. Now, this being now being able to score an agenda and make some money back, or if you're already flush on money, score an agenda and draw some cards to help you just keep the tempo going, could be 
could be more useful than you give it credit for because one of the tenets of playing corp is that when you try to go for a score you are sacrificing your board state in order to get closer to winning the game because as you you spend like if you want to if you want to score a 5-3 you basically have to pass two turns and lose five credits just to score that 5-3 you're not doing anything else in the meantime so you have to you have to take a big loss of tempo and board state and money in order to become get agenda points to get closer to winning the game, and this uh, lessens that tempo loss significantly. Plus, in this type of deck, as we'll see with the coming cards, there's a very unique uh, theme with this with the HB cards in this box, where you play a lot of like really tiny or like fake negative one agenda point cards, and then you have cards that build off how many quote-unquote agendas are in their own score area. So I think the way you're definitely going to play this ID is with a lot of like small one and two pointers. And of course, finally, something I'm actually really happy about is an HB deck where you put, you auto-include three domestic sleepers in your deck or you're wrong. And domestic sleeper is low-key one of my favorite HB cards. It's, it's, it's an agenda that I've always wanted to be able to make use of and if you're running this whole fake agenda point thing that this ID really wants you to do, uh, three of domestic sleepers is auto include, and I really like that. So if you, if you're so you can play small agendas and just kind of hammer them out, hammer them out, uh, spending little to no money to actually score them and keeping your tempo up, uh, especially if you're playing things like uh, lateral growth to help just windmill things into servers really fast. You can also, if you're already rich enough, you can install, score an agenda, draw more cards. If you're losing, it gets you money and gets you tempo if you want. So it it sounds like kind of a weak effect, but I think it might be something that if you if you don't respect it, it'll come back to bite you later on. So there's this this you could definitely play, you know, a lot of you play, definitely play, you know, other strategies than the one they're trying to suggest to you with this box with this ID. Again, if in, in, a, in a general rush strategy, you could play this or next or ASA group and all three have, you know, viable give and take uh, compared to each other. You can go with whichever one you want. But I think with the cards that are in this box, Sports Metal definitely gives you the most unique way to go about doing that. So it'll be doing something that'll be fun to test. Sport! Sport! Um, thank you, Barry. Then we've got a really blurry spoiler of a agenda, for a, which is a 3-1. It's Hyperloop Extension, and it says when it is scored or stolen, the corp gains three credits. And I am kind of liking these, like, scored or stolen effects. Uh, I think they're really cool for the game. Uh, this one's, it's, it's really straightforward. I mean, you score it, it refunds itself, or the runner steals it and you get some money. Uh, this also works really well with Sports Metal itself, though, because you can score a 3-1 while uh, it pays for itself and you draw cards or get credits. Or even if the runner steals this, like, this basically, is, in Sports Metal, this basically reads the runner steal this, steals this and the corp gains five. So it's kind of like, it's, or draws, or gains three and draws two, two cards. So it's a lot like Explode a Palooza, but it's a one-pointer instead of a Two pointer, so that could that could be pretty cool. Again, I, th I think the agenda suite for sports metal is going to be really, really wonky to figure out, but this will probably be in it. Then we've got a new piece of ice. This is Gatekeeper. It is three to res, two influence, zero strength code gate. Uh, it is it has plus six strength if you resed it this turn. And it has two subs, which are end the run, and draw up to three cards, reveal up to three agendas in HQ and or archives, and then shuffle those agendas into R&D. All right, so it definitely seems like uh, Boggs is trying to give every faction their own Jackson replacement. And this is, a, this is supposed to be HBs. Uh, they all seem to share the reveal agendas in HQ or archives and shuffle them effect. This one... Uh, 
really on the fence about. I mean, obviously a three to res six strength code gate that lets you filter agendas and end the run is pretty darn spiffy. Plus it also draws you cards. So it safely draws you cards without flooding you. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, the, the face check value of this is really high, but it only works the turn. You, it, it only works the turn you res it. It only works when the runner runs into it on the server that you put it on. And then after that, it does still tax them a little bit. But it is still possible for them to break this if they really want to. So, uh, I'm, I mean, it's, it's definitely weaker than the other things like drudge work and attitude adjustment that are, you'll see later, that are just straight up better Jackson type effects. So this one, I don't know, the great... People do are not going to want to spend, you know, they're not going to want to spend the money to break a six strength code gate just to prevent a just to prevent you know uh, an agenda shuffling effect nine times out of ten. So this might be better than I get it credit for, but I don't think it's going to be uh, reliable enough. Not not in the way that like you know Mirage and everything and the, those kinds of ice are. And then we've got another new piece of ice. That's kind of odd. This is Meridian. So it's a 3 to res 4 strength barrier. It has 3 in, three influence and it has one subroutine that says gain 4 and end the run unless the runner adds Meridian to their score area as an agenda worth negative 1 agenda point. So this card is a lot of things. Uh, it's, a, it's a card obviously specifically meant to work with sports metal where it you know, does the whole, like, negative agenda point stacking thing. Uh, it also is a card that lets the runner choose their punishment, but both punishments suck. And it's also probably the best thing we're going to get as a replacement for Eli 1.0. And I know that HB has, you know, really, really, really been wanting a go-to barrier besides, say, their adaptive barrier. It would have to fill the hole that Eli One left in their hearts, but this is this is probably the best we're going to get, and I don't mean that in a negative way. This is probably a pretty solid piece of ice. I mean, it's it's very unusual, but it's got you know three to res, four strength, one sub instead of two. But obviously, the runner does not want the corp to get a free hedge fund and end the run, so they're going to pay to break this. And if they tried now, if and if they try to just walk through it by taking the other effect, negative one agenda point is really obnoxious, uh, especially in a deck like this, or even in most HB decks where you know you or you, you know instead of instead of having to score three agendas to win, now you have to score four. So that definitely extends the game. So this I could definitely see this in like. A, Architects of Tomorrow type decks to help draw out the games. You can get that massive late game Jinja nonsense server. Uh, obviously, this also just if the if they let it go off, it just feeds into the whole uh, fake agenda point thing that Sports Metal is trying to do. Now, now again, this is an ice that if the runner eats the negative agenda point effect, this piece of ice is gone. So. A, run a runner might be willing to take the negative one agenda point to get rid of your ice. So when you're deck building with this, I wouldn't really consider this a part of your normal ice suite. Uh, you probably want to consider this some kind of like extra flavor card or something like that. Because the runner, you know, taking a minus agenda point sucks, but in ex if, that, if in exchange for that you are completely defenseless because all your ice is gone, that's really bad. So I think I think the I think the key mistake people will make when they first try to use this card is they're going to treat it like part of their normal ice suite, and I don't think that's the right way to go about it. But if you're if you're waiting for like a nice HP barrier that's you know all around playable and isn't Naja One or say your adaptive barrier, this is almost certainly your best choice. All right, next up is Divert Power. This is a two to play, one influence operation. It says, de-res any number of cards. You may res a card, lowering its res cost by three for each card that you de-res this way. 
And this one's actually pretty interesting. I think this is a really fun little trick you can do uh, to help like res a giant piece of ice you've got in your deck. Like I think this works really well with the remote enforcement decks where, you know, if your remote enforcement isn't working, uh, you can still use divert power to res one of those giant piece of ice you put in your deck by de something small and crappy like a vanilla. You know, obviously vanilla, de a vanilla means nothing. So that would gain you three credits to res something bigger. But you would have to res, you would have to de at least two of your own cards in order to gain good value for this. But you can de any cards. They don't have to be ice. You could, you know, de your zero-cost Mumbed Virtual Tours or something like that, or you know, your Monza City Grids that cost nothing to res and it doesn't even matter. You know, there's there's definitely some ways you can use this to res a giant piece of ice when the runner didn't think you'd be able to. And at, and at one influence, I'm thinking there might be some sneaky tricks you can do by splashing this into other into other factions. All right, next is Fast Break. This is a three influence, four to play operation. It says gain X credits, draw up to X cards, install up to X cards in and or protecting a single remote server, paying all install costs. X is the number of agendas in the runner's score area. So this plays into the, again, really unusual new mechanic that they're giving HB in this box, which is uh, giving the runner lots of fake agendas so that they can power their cards by the number of agendas that the runner has, which is definitely an unusual thing to do. The, the one issue with this card is that it is four to play, which means the point at which this becomes economically valuable is pretty late in the game, so I definitely wouldn't rely on this as any kind of primary tempo card. I'd probably, you'd probably singleton it into a deck if you used it at all. But, you know, because once, once you have four, and once the runner has four agendas, the gain X credits just pays for its own cost, which is then, it then becomes draw X cards, install cards. I mean, I could see some synergy with this and Ginger City Grid, because you draw a bunch of cards you install everything from Ginger Grid that's not ice, then the things that, or, or that, sorry, that is ice, then you use the fast break effect to install the agendas and or upgrades into that server. So you can just, in one fell swoop, you could significantly upgrade your Ginger Grid server and slam agendas and upgrades into it all in one click. But still, I don't, it just mostly because of that four to play cost, making this not really useful until pretty late in the game. I don't think you'd run more than one of these. And right after that, we've got yet another runner agenda based card. This is Game Changer. It is five influence, six to play, two to trash. It says gain a click for each agenda in the runner score area. Remove this from the game instead of trashing it. And let's be real, way more important than the effects of this card is what the hell is on that guy's head? Like, seriously, is this supposed to be football or something? I don't know what, like, future sports ball thing is going on in these cards, but what what on earth is on that guy's head? Like, seriously, I just... It's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. But besides that, this card is really weird. And for if you're, if you're not playing it specifically in the load the runner full of fake agendas thing plan, then there's no reason to play it because you have to, you have to compare this to biotic labor. If the runner has scored no agendas, this card literally cannot even be played. If the runner has scored one agendas, this is a substantially worse version of biotic labor. If the runner has scored two agendas, this becomes more viable because you gain enough that you can fast advance a 4-2. And at that point, the increased cost and trashability are reasonable. If the runner has scored three agendas or more, then this card is just absurd. So you have, you have to have fed the runner two agendas 
you know, or two fan sites in order for this to be good. If you're if you're not planning on doing that, then don't bother playing this card. But in that specific deck, like this, the, the name of the, the name of the card fits. You know, if the, if they've got a bunch of little one pointers or domestic sleepers or whatever in their score area, and you suddenly start fast advancing five threes or something like that, that'll turn a game around. It's the the card the card does what it says on the little title strip. Just I will I will never know what that guy's hat is. I I'll never know. And we're gonna end HB with Giordano Memorial Field. This is a unique upgrade. It's three to res, three to trash, two influence. It says whenever there is a success, success the successful run on this server, end the run unless the runner pays two credits for each agenda in his or her score area. So clearly this is like a spin-off of Ash, and it it plays really well into the you know he'll he'll feed feed the runner a bunch of tiny or fake agenda scenarios. Like if you've got if you've got three or four of those in their score area, this is you know six, eight, ten credits they have to pay to get into that server. And you know again, it kind of only works in late game, but Ash was kind of like that anyway. So I think de definitely in the agenda stacking playstyle, you would just use this the same way you would use Ash. And in that style, I think it would probably be better than Ash because you don't have to pay to fight the trace. That's usually what Ash is. is a big uh, raw money fight. Can you win the trace or not? This is just res it and it does the work by itself. You don't have to, you don't have to win the trace fight. Now, outside of that particular strategy, it obviously isn't as good just because you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get that tax high enough. This could be good. This could be in this strategy. This could be a, actually a really solid card, not just for protecting your scoring remote, but just from protecting your centrals against run events like indexing or diversion of funds or anything like that. Uh, clearly, the longer in the game it goes, uh, the more the stronger it's going to get. But this could. This could be a really solid like late game lockout tool. If you got to pay an if you got to pay an extra like you know eight to ten credits to get into a server every time you get into it, and then three credits to trash this. It's 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 handcrafted for this play style, but it could it could very well be a pretty strong card in it. All right, then we've got the shiny new Jinteki ID using a piece of art that we've actually had floating around for quite some time. Hmm. This is Saraswati Mnemonics. It's at 4515, and it has an active ability on it. Click credit, install a card from HQ on a rem in, a, in a remote server, then place one advancement token on it. You cannot score or res that card until your next turn begins. So what this is, is this is the home for all your Mushin decks from now on, basically, or at least an awful lot of them, because that's what this idea ability is. This is a built-in Mushin. Uh, it isn't quite as strong as Mushin, because Mushin, you could ins you could use it and then install something one more time, so you could Mushin something out at four counters, uh, whereas this one, you can put something out at three counters. It's not quite as strong, because uh, you can install advance, advance, advance in the same turn. However, unlike Mushin, you can put it behind a piece of ice, and that's really, really important. Mushin has to be in a new, in a brand new naked server. So this is a slightly weaker Mushin effect, but also allows you to put it behind ice, which is really, really nice. So it also reduces your uh, reliance on finding copies of Mushin no Shinx. If you've if you've played a hardcore Mushin spam deck, you need three copies of Mushin and you need like two or three copies of archive memories that you can get your Mushins back as often as possible. This just gives you Mushin on a stick from turn one. Like a mini, a mini Mushin on a stick from turn one, which is which is not bad. So this this is clearly an ID meant specifically to just be a ruse factory. That's what it is. This this is a this is a ruse factory ID. And that's not that's never been competitive because by its nature, you know, it's just inconsistent. Uh, sometimes your ruses work and you completely blow the runner out of the water. Sometimes they just don't fall for it. 
but it is incredibly fun and is what a lot of people really who, who play Jinteki, like me, really like about Jinteki is just littering the field with minefields and traps and daring the runner to come get you. Like that's 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 one of the core tenets of Jinteki is just like stand stand at the end of a hallway full of bear traps and just dare the runner to come get you. So this is this is definitely an ID meant specifically for people who really really love advancement traps and really really love Mushinoshin. All right, then it's something we haven't seen in a bit, a 6-2 agenda. This is Juman, and it says, when your turn ends, place two advancement tokens on a card installed in a server. Now, note that it says, in a server, not protecting the server, so you cannot use this to abuse advanceable ice into oblivion, but this is an agenda that is clearly meant to go with a Mushin-style deck, since that is basically... The, a, the only flipping way you're going to score this is if you motion it and they don't run it and you score it out next turn. But B, the ability allows, basically gives you a free motion every freaking turn. You can, just, you can just start barfing out ruses left and right like it's nobody's business. You don't have to wait until you draw another copy of motion to do it. And there are some things this is really, really good with. Like, obviously, this is dumb with NGO front. You just slap it down and get it advanced for free. Uh, this can probably do some stupid nonsense with false flag. I'm betting like if this if this ID goes anywhere, it's probably going to be false it's like some like motion spamming and false flagging abuse, because this just makes that stupid. Other than that, it's like yeah, this is this is just it's a ruse machine. Like you, you have you have to you have to win a ruse to get this out, and then this just lets you ruse at will for the rest of the game. So, is that good? Is that fun? Oh yeah, it's fun. Like if if you want if you want Mush, if you like motion decks and you like just daring the runner to run shit at any given time, like this will absolutely do that. Then right after that, we've got API S Keeper Isabel, which is a unique two to res, four to trash, two influence asset. It says when your turn begins, you may remove an advancement token from an installed card to gain three credits. Now this one actually does work with installed ice, or, uh, so you could do it with advanced ice, but I'm not sure exactly how, good, how useful that would be. But the big, the big feature that this gives you is that this lets your failed ruses still mean something. That's what, that's what the point of this. You put down a June bug, they don't run it. You, 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 try, you try to mess with the runner and it doesn't work. And this lets you turn that into a bunch of money, which is pretty good, actually. So if you're playing this whole, like, motion shell game nonsense thing that this ID really wants you to play, you know, inevitably some of those are not going to work. So you put this down, and it's hard for the runner to trash. But if they don't trash it, you just get three credits turn which is obviously a whole freaking lot of economy. So, and then obviously this comboed with Juman, if you get if you get Juman scored and you drop this out, that becomes a just ridiculous econ engine because even if you're not, and any time that you're not rusing, you're gaining three credits at the end of the turn, which is an enormous amount of econ. So there's, there is the issue, this is kind of, this is a card meant to fix when things don't work as opposed to make things work more often. And that's a very important decision. Whenever you're running any kind of, you know, combo deck or ruse deck or anything like that, uh, it's always better to have cards that make your tricks work more frequently than have cards that try to fix things when things don't work. Uh, but still, this is an uh, this this can get you an awful lot of money. Then we've got a spiffy new advanceable trap for Jinteki. This is Neurostasis. It is two influence, it is zero to res, it is one to trash, and it can be advanced. If you pay three credits when the runner accesses it, choose one installed runner card for each advancement token on it, the runner must shuffle the chosen cards into their deck. And this is kind of a nuanced card, I would say, because most people play techie will pass it over and be like, it's, it's not damage, forget it. You know, my advanceable traps are June bugs and Strebel overriders and Ronins and nothing else matters. 
But the effect of this to shuffle cards back into the runner's deck is really powerful because if you try to play the shell game, you know, Mushin nonsense kind of thing that the that this box really, really wants you to play, uh, you'll learn real fast that the way that fail, the way that stops working is if the runner can lock your centrals. Because if they can run your hand, the, one of the big counterplays to Mushin decks and shell game is either establish R&D locks, so you trash all their traps before they can draw them, or B, keep running their hand first before you even attempt to play the shell game. That way, if they put down if they put down an agenda and have a trap in your hand, you'll trash the trap. And if they put down a trap and they have an agenda in your hand, you'll steal the agenda. So lock, being able to lock down your HQ and R&D kills shell game decks really hard. And this, now granted, you do have to win the shell game in order for this to go off, but if the runner does fall for this, it allows you to shuffle all their breakers and econ cards and everything else back into their deck so that they can't get into your centrals, so they have to play your shell game again. And that's pretty important. So you won't, I don't think you'll see this all the time in Jinteki decks, unless like unless you're tr going to do this as like your primary advancement trap, which is I'm going to score out, and if you like if you screw up and hit one of these, then I shuffle your breakers back in, so you just can't get into my stuff. So even even in a regular uh, even in a regular like Palana Rush type of deck, this might have some value because uh, like you install advance advance it like you shuffle back two breakers and you'll like that's a scoring window, that's pretty good. Uh, but this also has I'm sure a lot of use in Asmari Ed Tech style decks with all the NBN, you know, bounce to hand, shuffle back in your deck nonsense. I wouldn't be surprised if you start started seeing like one or two copies of this splashed into Asmari decks. Because it's it's kind of like this goes into Asmari's decks the kind of the same way that Cerebral Overrider goes in Jateki decks. Like it's basically a card from another faction, but it's not because we really can't let that hat fact we really can't let that faction have it for free. Like you can't you can't let Jinteki have Cerebral Overrider for free. You can't let NBN have Neurostasis for free. So yeah, I think I think I think a lot of like fresher Jinteki players are going to pass over this just because it's not damage. I don't care, but I think this is something like Singleton into a deck is going to turn around a lot of games and catch a lot of people off guard. Next up is Odoroshi. This is a 2 influence, 2 to res, 5 strength sentry. It has one sub and it says, you may place up to three advancement tokens on a card installed in a server. If you do, the runner accesses that card unless they pay three credits. So this card basically tells the runner either pay money or deal with my nonsense. That's that's basically what it is. This, is, this, is a, this card is a tax for not having to deal with Jinteki's bullshit. So if you if the runner if the runner lets this lets this fire and if a 5 to res sentry is pretty steep, if the runner lets this fire, you get your free advancements. You know, then presumably you'll put them on a trap. But if the runner still pays 3 to not access it. So most of the time the runner is just going to run through this, pay the 3. It's 2 to res for consistent 3 credit tax, so that ain't bad. But then the runner's going to feel really crappy when you know they do this one time, and then it allows you to like score a false flag that they thought was a June bug, or you know score any other agenda that they just didn't that they thought was a trap. So that's mostly what this. This is this is kind of this is kind of sort of like a miniature version of a Nancy, where you either you either pay the tax to break it, or you deal with Jinteki nonsense being nonsense. So. It's, Obviously, this goes really. This goes specifically in shell game trap decks, of course, because that's what this box is all about. But yeah, this is this is good. this is a constant tax on the runner in order to prevent them from having to deal with you being Jindaki. And next is Thimble Rig, I believe that's what that says. This is a one influence two to res zero strength code gate. It has just a simple end the run sub, and it says when your turn begins or whenever the runner passes it, you may swap it with another installed piece of ice. So this is a super weird little card. It lets the corp like infinitely inversificate themselves. 
which is really odd. So it's kind of like an ice version of replanting. And there is at least one deck I can think of that can use that can use this. But posi positional ice has almost always been really bad. And having cards that fix positional ice helps, but it's better to just play better, less restrictive ice. So now if, now if you leave this out, you do have to get the runner to run it once, you can res it. But assuming it you res it the first time, you can rearrange, you can eventually rearrange all your servers perfectly because every turn you get to swap this with something else. You can you can eventually arrange your ice exactly the way you want them. So a singleton of this in a deck might be okay, just you know, just because you can you can rearrange your ice the way you want. It might help you turn, give you a little bit of advantage in a game, but you could also just run any other piece of ice. So, you know, or play, or if you need to rearrange your ice once, play replanting rather than having rather than having this out. So, again, this this is a card that you might use when you're new at the game, and then you later on discard because. The, the better thing to do than play this is to just learn how to play how to install your ice better that's that's the choice this this is something that you shouldn't need if you're good at the game because the correct answer to this is just learn to place your ice better in the first place rather than putting cards in your deck specifically to fix your own mistakes so yeah not no, not crazy about this all right, then we finally get Jinteki's Reprisal. This is Hangeki, zero to play, two influence. Play only if the runner trashed a corp card during his or her last turn. Choose an installed corp card. The runner may access that card. If they do, remove it from the game instead of trashing it. Otherwise, add Hangeki to their runner score area as an agenda worth minus one agenda point. So just to streamline that a little bit, the runner trash is one of your things. You play this, they either access a card of your choice or they take this as a negative one agenda point. And uh, I'm not crazy about this one. I think th this is probably the weakest of the reprisals, which is annoying because like, if there was a corp that should have the best reprisal, it should be Jinteki or Wayland. Uh, but I think the thing is, what what is the actual value of negative one agenda point? It's like, well, it does mid drag the game out a bit longer, so you have more attempts to ruse them. Uh, or in this sense, they might call your they might call your bluff and go ahead and run that, you know, motioned out June bug that's been sitting there forever or something like that. Uh, it's this do, this. The, the best use I can probably see for this is to be something else to feed into uh, the 24-7 news cycle Philotic Entanglement decks, because uh, that is that is def like the, the PE decks that do that. This is another agenda to shove into the runner score area, so that when you fire your Philotic Entanglement, you just have more things to smack them with, and this also delays the game longer, so you have more time to build that up. That's probably the best use for this. Outside of that, I'm really not seeing much use for this at all. It's not... You, it, you, it kind of only works in PE, or some or in motion decks, where you have like a big, fat, nasty card uh, for them, Junebug or something, for them to run into, or just like a snare that you installed and just left there. You... It kind of only works in motion decks. Outside of that, it doesn't have much of any use. So it might be okay one or two of in like a like the PE philotic decks, but other than that, it's it's way too niche. Then last Virgin Techie, we've got Daruma. Is a three influence, one to res, two to trash upgrade. It says when the runner approaches the server, you may trash it. If you do, swap a card installed in the server with either another call card installed in a server or with an agenda, asset, or upgrade from HQ. So this is basically just a powered-up version of Toshiki Sakai. It has pretty much the same effect that he did, just better. That's pretty much what it is. And this, this card just makes you ask the, ask the runner the question, are you sure? 
after everything they do. Like that's kind of what this is for. Is like if you if you thought rusing them once wasn't enough, now you can ruse them twice in the same run and just ask ask the runner, is that your final answer after literally everything they do? So it's it's super obnoxious. So this is a, this is just this is just an improved version of Toshiki Sakai. So if you, you know, if you loved shell games, then this puts some shell games in your shell games. So have fun with that. All right, for NBN, we have a Wiley Coyote reference for some reason. I don't know why, but this is Acme Consulting. It's a 4515, and it says the runner is considered to have one additional tag, even if they have zero, during encounters with the outermost piece of ice protecting any server. And this is actually a really interesting ID. As much as I have been known to really, really, really hate NBN, this actually piques my interest, uh, especially in design space, because this identity does something really, really cool, and something that I really, really like in card games, is that this breathes an enormous amount of life back into a huge portion of previously unused cards. I think that's kind of what the exact purpose of this ID is to do, because there's, there's so much ice that if the runner is tagged when the runner runs into this, they're way, way, way more dangerous, but getting the runner to run into the dice while they're tagged, it's like, well, you put a data raven in front of it, but that's that's pretty much it. Like That's all, that's all you can hope for. And this uh, automatically activates that effect on all those ice. It doesn't literally give them a tag. They don't have to remove the tag. They are considered to have the status effect check, yes, you are tagged when they encounter those ice. And like, and the most, most amazing part is this is not once a turn. This is every time. This is not once a turn, and that's ridiculous. But there's so many ridiculous ice that make, like, Pachinko is actually something now. But even then, there's there's other things, like a Data Ward is now an absolute monster. Data Ward is absurd. There's another piece of ice uh, coming after this that's really, really nasty. And there's, and the, above all, though, there's one piece of ice that everyone probably totally forgot about that absolutely breaks this ID, and that's universal connectivity fee. Universal connectivity fee absolutely just just launches this ID into a whole other realm of nonsense. Because if you're tagged and you touch and you touch it, and it's a trap ice, so if you don't have an AI, you have to eat the effect. You get closed accounts. This, this is one of those IDs, kind of like how you had like all the uh, Ag Infusion Excalibur nonsense. This is, this is an ID where you must have an AI to deal with this ID or you will get ruined. Because every time you touch Universal Connectivity Fee, you, get close, you lose all of your money if you, don't have an, if you don't have an ID. Plus, on top of that, that card trashes itself. So you're now running on the thing behind it if you keep going, and now the thing behind it is the outermost piece of ice, and it still gets the if you are tagged effect from Acme Consulting. So yeah, like yeah, it's it's not just Data Ward and Pachinko and uh, this other ice coming up. Universal connectivity fee is just straight up busted in this ID. It's what it's going to be one of those things where you you if you want to deal with this ID, either play employee strike or have an AI, or it will run you the hell over. Uh, the one drawback of this, though, besides the weakness to employee strike, is that while it is fantastically good at making these like one ice wonder servers, it's really bad at building up big servers because it's only the outermost piece of ice that gets those effects. So it's it's really bad at building up big nasty servers. Uh, but this that ends up going really well with something that yellow hasn't really had before, and that's a super hard rush ID. Because you can you can res one piece of ice and have it be like a freaking data ward, which is an absolute monster to deal with. And just and just have just like rush out behind one giant big fat piece of ice. That's probably the best you're gonna be able to do with this ID, and that's something Yellow hasn't really had before, and it's 
it's going to be it's I'm thinking it's going to be pretty good because even because the the, the ice that you res with Acme Consulting is just terrifying. All right, then we're going to follow up that really annoying yellow ID with a really annoying yellow agenda. This is fly on the wall. It is a three one, and it says when you score it, give the runner one tag. And lo and behold, it's the fixed version of breaking news. That's that's what this is. This is this is the rebalanced fixed version of breaking news. And that's something I know a lot of NBN players have really been missing is the stupid nonsense you could do with breaking news. And I hated that card so much especially with 24-7 news cycle. But, and this is, this allows you to do a lot of the same things. Now you can't fast advance it and close accounts the runner all in one turn. You do have to, you know, leave this on, you have to leave this on the table for at least one turn, then the next turn score it and, you know, mess with the runner with exchange of information or closed accounts or something like that. Or you can still 24-7 uh, news cycle it like you could before with breaking news. It's just you can't do it like whenever the hell you want because it's a two one. This is a this takes this does this does essentially the same thing as breaking news. It's just a little more fair and a little more difficult to do because that was the problem with breaking news. It was too easy. So this this is the rebalanced version of breaking news. I know a lot of NBA players are really happy to see this because it's going to bring back some of that nonsense they used to be able to do, just not quite as broken. So. I'm not happy to see it because I hated breaking news, but I know a lot of NBN players are really glad to have this trick back in their in their toolbox. Then we've got SIU. So this is a three influence unique asset. It is three to res, one to trash. It says when your turn begins, you may trash it to trace three. If successful, give the runners one tag. So there's one place for this, and I think we all know where it is, and that's controlling the message, where you just let this sit out on the board and don't bother resing it until you have a big enough economy of economy advantage that you can just res it and pop it and hit the runner with a tag and then slam them with uh, closed accounts or exchange of information. You know, but then of course in order to do that you have to compare it to C source. So this is that's basically what this is. This is an asset version of C source. Which one would you rather play? I mean in CTM Outside of CTM, you just play C source. In CTM, it's actually pretty debatable which one of these you would go with. Uh, right now, there's of course a buttload of clan vendors going around, so sitting on C source in your hand, it might actually be better to just put it out on the board where you can use it later. That's a legitimate argument right now. Uh, besides that, it's probably uh, it's probably just up to you. Like if you're playing a CTM deck, you can play this or C source, and it's it's pretty much up to you which one you want to go with. But outside of that, I don't think we're going to see it anywhere. And next is Peeping Tom. So we get more cats. That's always cool. This is a 4 to res, 4 strength code gate, 3 influence. And it says, when the runner encounters it, name a card type, then reveal all cards in the grip. It gains end the run unless the runner takes one tag for each revealed card that has the named type. And... I'm just gonna say it. This is my card. This is this 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 is my my card. This is a NBN version of Koma Inu, and I made a thread in Stimhack a while ago about making NBN and Wayland versions of Koma Inu slash Brainstorm, and this was almost exactly my idea for an NBN Koma Inu. Like bogs get out of my brain. I just get it, get out of my head, stop reading my mind, or keep reading my mind, because apparently I have really good ideas if you put this in the game. So cool. But this is this is a NBN version of Koma Inu, and it's pretty freaking nice. I mean you have to you get when the runner encounters it, you get the information of what they have in their hand no matter what. So even if you guess something and there's not any even if you guess and whiff you still get the information, and then yeah, even even if you hit like even if you hit like two things, it's a four to res four strength code gate with two and the run subs, or they take two tags to get through it. Like there's there's almost there's all the the best case scenario of this is ridiculous. 
where you get like four or you get like you know three or four subs on it but even one or two plus the reveal is not bad you know plus you can also of course combo the reveal with things like you know salem's hospitality uh, standard procedure standard procedure loves this card because you don't because you don't have to guess anymore so the the, re the reveal from this might be worth it just so you can play standard procedure and gate and know what to yell to gain a buttload of money it goes amazing in ed tech because you know what to call with ed tech so yeah, the, the on the on encounter reveal effect uh, goes really really well with a lot of other currently strong NBN effects. So this is this is this is a good piece of ice. This is this is a good piece of ice. So I again, of course, now it dies to hunting grounds just like Koma Inu does, and NBN in general kind of dies to hunting grounds. But that's something they've always had to deal with. But this a but this this is this is a good piece of ice though it puts more cats in the game so that's always cool and this is a this is a pretty strong thing I wouldn't I wouldn't count this out at all and next we've got that big nasty piece of yellow ice I was talking about this is Hydra this is a four influence ten Derez, six strength sentry it has three subs the subs say do three net damage if the runner is tagged otherwise give the runner a tag. Gain five credits if the runner is tagged, otherwise give the runner one tag. And end the run if the runner is tagged, otherwise give the runner one tag. Now, obviously this is meant to go hand in hand with Acme, because Acme just activates the better version of all three of those subroutines, as long as this is, this is the outside. The one big hurdle, of course, is that tender res is like very, very unpalatable. However, if you do res pay the ten... Uh, and they face check it, you get five of it back. So since you know a six to res three strength sentry is qu is quite nasty, uh, they're probably going to end up face checking this the first time they run into it, which means a lot of times you'll pay the ten get five backs. So it was net five to res for a six strength three sub sentry with very nasty subroutines that includes doing damage and ending the run. So this is. Super, super mean, and you have. And when it comes to breaking this, you can't really let one subroutine fire because it gives you a tag, which then activates the other subroutines. So you can't just like, like you do with Mouseless or Hordum, where you just break the end the run and let everything else fire because you'll still get messed up. Well, I guess you, I guess you could, but the corp would get an awful lot out of it. So, so yeah, this is this is meant to go hand in hand with Acme. And this is this is an absolutely vicious piece of ice to face to face plant into. I don't think I have to tell you, you know, the court the court playing paying five to res a six strength sentry that makes the runner get snared and ends the run. Like a sentry that ends the run is very very mean. Like this this is pretty much the NBN equivalent of Archer for all intents and purposes. This is the NBN equivalent of Archer or maybe Tithonium, and that's. Really intimidating. Now, would you, would you play this in any other NBN ID? May I could see maybe putting a copy into uh, into Asmari EdTech just because that ID gets so filthy rich that a, that even hard resing a Hydra when you won't gain the five back is still something you can not be that worried about. You know, that's pretty much score and you know, have an SSL get scored or stolen. Great, I get a Hydra now, thanks. So, yeah, it's it's tricky. It's tricky to use, but the payoff to this is massive. Then we've got eavesdrop. This is a one to play, two influence operation. It says install it on a piece of ice as a hosted condition counter with the text. Whenever the runner encounters host ice, trace three. If successful, give the runner one tag. So there are there. Are, are some very commonly played NBN ice, namely IP Block and Newshound and Tollbooth, and now also counting uh, Data Ward, where when you touch them, you have to pay three. And this just adds that onto whatever ice you want, which could give it to an ice that didn't have it, or of course just make it even worse for something that already had it. And uh, Hosted condition counters on ice have traditionally been very bad, uh, but one of the reasons for that, and I think this is something a lot of people are going to overlook, is that all the previous hosted condition counters for ice, they had to be resed ice. 
So the runner had to run into it at least once, then you would put the condition encounter on it, then the runner would have to come at it again, knowing what it was, and I mean, presumably with the ability to break it already. The one thing that I think people are going to overlook is that this says you can start, the ice does not have to be resed. So you can drop this on an unresed piece of ice and the runner has no idea what it is. So make, which makes the face check even scarier and plays in even more with uh, Acme's style of, like I said, the big fat whopping like one, one ice wonder servers where you just make one monstrous beefy piece of ice that the runner just doesn't want to deal with. So the, will this see a lot of play outside of that? Probably not, because it's still a host condition counter in the ice, and those are... This is a better version, but it's still not great. Uh, but it's not. It's definitely better. Uh, that, one, that, one, that one little thing where the, you don't have to wait for the ice to be res first before you drop this on it is, is definitely relevant. Then we've got Attitude Adjustment. This particularly evil card is a two to play, two influence operation. It says draw two cards, reveal up to two agendas in HQ and or archives, gain two credits for each agenda revealed, then shuffle those agendas into R&D. So all of you, you know, long-standing holdouts who just refuse to acknowledge the loss of Jackson Howard, this is easily the best you're gonna get to take his place. This is an operation version of Jackson Howard. We've been getting numerous different attempts at new Jackson replacements, and they've been perfectly fine. I've been pretty happy with the Jackson replacement cards, but this is definitely the strongest one we've seen as far as just dealing with agenda flood and, you know, just, well, dealing with agenda flood, because that's Jackson's job. This is easily the best one of those we've seen. So NBN still gets by far the strongest Jackson replacement. This not only draws you cards and hides your agendas like Jackson did, it also gets you money for doing it. And even better, it lets you hide you can hide agendas out of archives and HQ at the same time. Like if you see even one agenda with this, it pays for itself. You see two, you gain two credits while drawing two cards and hiding two agendas. It's really freaking good. So if, if, if any, anyone who's sitting here still mourning Jackson Howard, you can finally shut up now because this is the best Jackson Howard replacement we've seen. It's very, very good. All right, next is Arella Salvatore. Some lady trying to do some kind of Game of Thrones reference here or something. But it's two to res, five to trash, three influence, unique upgrade. Whenever an agenda is scored from the server, you may install a card from HQ, ignoring all costs, and place one advancement token on it. So this is supposed to be some new kind of uh, fast advance tool for NBN. And uh, I guess maybe you would singleton this into a deck, maybe, but I don't think this one's particularly good because the, uh, the problem with this one is it, it does give you, you know, a fast advance proc. You can hit a, you can fast advance three one or a three two, but it's only if you already scored another agenda on the last turn. So this, this only kicks in if you're literally just windmilling agendas out of your hand turn after turn after turn. That's that's how this, you, you score one agenda and you immediately score another one. That's when this goes off. Now sometimes that's useful. Uh, so again, like maybe maybe a singleton into the deck, but if you compare this to calibration testing, especially calibration testing and team sponsorship because Fisk that combo, but yeah, this is this is way less reliable. You might you might Singleton it into a deck just on the off chance that you get an extra fast advance tool to help you close out the game, but or take advantage of like a big window you have. But just calibration testing is way more reliable. All right. Ironically, this is the last ID we're going to talk about in the video, and it was the first ID spoiled. This is the outfit. It is a 4515, and it says gain three credits whenever you take at least one bad publicity. And that is simple, it's straightforward, it's very Wayland. But I think what this 
ID will do more than anything else, especially for new players, is teach the value of bad publicity, because never, ever, ever underestimate bad pub. Bad One bad pub is very, very, very close to just having a free Desperado. Except those can't stack, bad publicity can. And gaining, a, gaining more than one bad pub is usually a very, very bad thing, as any Wayland player will tell you, or anyone who's been sitting there getting mining accident by Valencia over and over again. Like, one bad pub you can live with. Anything more than that becomes a real problem. So this, at first, I kind of wasn't thrilled about it, because, like, is there an ID where you stack, like, four or five bad pub, and then, like, all your ice are blank? And then I thought about it a little more, and what this really is, is this is the epitome of balls to the wall aggressive rush decks. Not like nonsense, fast advance, titan weirdness where you just like tutor things in fast advance and tutor things in fast advance. You don't even bother defending yourself. This is the epitome of it's turn two. I have 25 credits. I can res literally any piece of ice in the game. Come at me, bro. You know, this is a there's, there's a lot of ice that, when resed, give you bad pub. There's obviously hostile takeover. There's stuff like uh, checkpoint and bulwark and a couple other things where uh, the bad pub effectively just drastically reduces the cost that it, of resing this piece of ice. I think, I think that's really what the outfit is. And a couple other cards in here as well will show that this no ID in the game can get burst econ like this ID. You, they may only have it for the first five turns of the game, and, you know, after that, you know, having four or five, six bad pub will effectively blank most of their ice. Uh, but no ID in the game is going to have burst econ like this ID has burst econ, and this ID is going to be the just, just the epitome of pedal to the metal, balls to the wall, like super hard throw, get burst econ, throw unusually large ice down, rush out agendas behind them, and one way or the other, this game will be over by turn five or six. I think that's that's what this that's what this ID really says is I don't I don't really care which one of us wins. I hope it's me, but what I really care about is this game is going to end in the next five minutes. I think I think that's really what the outfit says more than anything else. And that's definitely a very Wayland thing to do, so I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of on the fence gonna wait and see just how well this turns out. This could be surprisingly good. We'll see. Though, on a side note, I would really, really like to see someone make like a little like bad pub level tracker for the outfit, because we all know Wayland doesn't give a crap about bad pub. They stack it and stack it and stack it and whatnot. That's what this does, but I just want to see someone make like a little chart of how much bad pub like thematically equals something in the game. Like like one bad pub equals Wayland kicks puppies. You know, two bad pub, Wayland makes all their employees wear crocs. You know, three bad pub, Wayland makes the little puppies wear tiny crocs on their feet while the employees who are also wearing crocs are kicking the puppies. And then it just it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on from there. Like, I, I want to see someone make that and just come up with ridiculous things. You know, like, eight bad pub, they like Michael Bay movies. You know, so, come on, there's got, to, there's got to be some ridiculous things in here for that. Then, right after the outfit, we've got its signature agenda. This is Broad Daylight, a 4-2. And when you score it, you may take one bad publicity, place one agenda counter on it for each bad publicity you have, and click hosted agenda counter, do two meat damage, use this only once per turn. And hot damn, this agenda is absolutely terrifying. Uh, Wayland has had a couple of attempts at aggressive 4-2s, uh, meant to be played, finally be played over Oaktown Renovation or Corporate Sales Team. There was Armored Servers, which did not work out. There was Armed Intimidation, which was definitely better and definitely found a place in Jemison, but outside of that, didn't see any play. This is definitely strong enough 
in the outfit to be played over, or at least alongside Oaktown, because this is absolutely terrifying. Or so in the in the outfit particularly, is you pay, so you pay four credits in order to score this. You take a bad pub. You then get three of those credits back. So it costs you. It only costs you a net of one credit to score this agenda, and then you are given at bare minimum one use of the ability. But if you're playing the outfit, you will very, very likely get quite a few uses more. And this will just it's two meat damage a turn. So you you could you can even even rushing this out early game, you could easily have like two or three bad pub on this super early game and then just deal like two, four, six meat damage to the runner over the next couple of turns. That will slow down their tempo substantially which just feeds into your like super hard super fast rush style even more and if you manage if you manage to get two of these scored at a time you c can scorch the runner every turn which will almost certainly eventually kill them because they just can't draw up to stop that and yeah like this would this would this work anywhere else maybe in builder of nations because it works with the id ability but you're not barfing out bad pub nearly as fast. So I think I think this is pretty much just going to be the outfit's signature agenda. I don't think you're going to see it anywhere else, but in the outfit, this is a monster. Like, this is absolutely a 4-2, an, an aggressive 4-2, capable of just ripping the runner apart. And this, this you can... And this, it's going to be a really, really nasty thing for the runner to have to deal with. This is definitely the kind of thing that the outfit will use to end the game super, super fast. Because like you, you, you use your early lead to get this scored, and then you use this to make your early lead even bigger. And it's just ridiculous. I, I knew there was going to be a card that helped uh, the outfit leverage their bad pub in a way other than just getting money. And I was expecting something that maybe took away your bad pub or like fired your ID ability again so you got even more money for it or something like that. Uh, but this is definitely a much better thing to do. You leverage your bad pub into sheer raw damage, into a second form of pressure. So not just economic pressure, but uh, hand pressure as well. So yeah, this, this is a super, super nasty agenda. And after that, we've got Drudge Work. This is a 2 to res, 2 influence, 3 to trash asset. Place 3 power counters on it when it's resed. When there are no counters left on it, trash it. Click, hosted counter. Reveal an agenda in HQ or archives. Gain credits equal to its agenda points, then shuffle it into RNG. So this is a Wayland Jackson, and it ain't bad. Uh, it's really not. The fact that you can pick an agenda in HQ or archives... Uh, shuffle it into R&D and then gain money back is really nice. And this isn't once per turn, so if you get flooded or you just have stuff in archives and you slap this down, res it, use it twice, you could end up you know, shuffling away five points and still gaining a net of three credits. And then the runner has to run it you know, and get through whatever ice is in front of it and then pay three credits in order to trash it. So this is this is actually, as far as fixing Agenda Flood goes, this is a really solid card. Uh, and it's, I imagine it's stupid good in Gagarin, or IG, and that's, ugh, makes, puts, puts a little sour taste in my mouth, but this is definitely a very solid uh, Jackson-type card for Wayland to use. I don't think anyone else, except maybe IG, is going to spend influence to splash it in, but this is this is definitely uh, a respectable, you know, a very respectable Jackson replacement. Then we've got a new piece of ice for Wayland. This is Blockchain. It is a four influence, seven to res, four strength barrier. It has two subroutines, which are the corp gains one and the runner loses one, and end the run, but it also has another effect that says it gains an additional one of the money subroutines before all of its other subroutines for every two face-up transaction operations in archives. 
And I mean, right off the bat, this definitely looks like something you would put in Corset Wayland as a good, like, mainstay piece of ice in that. But Wayland, pretty much any kind of Wayland, likes to play lots of transactions. I mean, there's Beanstalk Royalties, Hedge Fund, IPO, you know, Green Level Clearance. There's, you know, all this, all the, there's, there's a ton, there's a ton. Adding, like, Having, having four transactions in your bin and adding two more subs to this should be pretty reasonable before you, before too long into the game. Like by by mid-game, you should be able to add two, if not, you should be, add, be able to add one or two subroutines to this pretty consistently. Uh, now, one little note, though, is when you use Brian Stinson, you remove the transactions from the game. So it's actually non-bows with Brian Stinson, which is kind of funny. But, yeah, this isn't bad. This isn't bad. I mean, the 7 to res, 4 strength, 2 subs is okay. That's not the best numbers, but once you start adding a couple of subroutines to this, like 7 to res, 4 strength for like 4 subroutines is perfectly fine, and it ends the run, and then they face check it, and you can get some of that money back and siphon some money from them. Or if they just break the end of the run and you let the other ones fire, sometimes runners like to do that, so... It is weak against pad tap, like several of Wayland's ice are, so that's something to point out. But it's not a bad piece of ice. Uh, this is, I mean, of course, that Wayland obviously gets the best use out of this, but it's not a bad piece of ice in general. All right, next is Formicary. This is a two to res, two strength, two influence sentry. It says when the runner approaches a server, you may res Formicary. If you do, Move it to the innermost position of that server the runner is now encountering it. End the run unless the runner suffers two net damage. And uh, I'm not too crazy about this one. Uh, it is like a fun little surprise to pull on people, because you can res it no matter where it is and shove it in the innermost server, innermost ice on the server so that the runner has to deal with it. But it's still only two strength, only one sub. It can't be bounced around every time they approach a server. It's just the first time you res it. And also the runner can just eat the damage and get through anyway. So like it could be it don't it could be useful for like an early game just annoyance, but this is gonna fall off really hard after the first few turns of the game. And like if you if you could warp it around every time and it would be like attacks that the runner always had to deal with that would be cool, but it's because it only goes off the first time you res it. Uh, I think that holds it back an awful lot. Then we've got building blocks. This is a four influence, five to play operation that says reveal a barrier from HQ. Install and res it, ignoring all costs. And well, shit, it gets, it's simple, it's short, it's sweet, and it's really strong. Like, Obviously, the five to play means you can't really use this as a regular econ card, but there's Wayland has no shortage of giant whopping barriers that you can cheat out with this for a huge discount. Like there's Bulwark, there's Hadrian's Wall, there's uh, Orion is a barrier. You could cheat out an Orion for five or Asteroid Belt without having to advance it. Like Splash in a Chiashi for two influence, that's no problem. Install and res a Chiashi for five instead of twelve. And plus whatever it costs to install it. Like this will This is really freaking strong. Like it's not I mean it's not something you'll see all the time, but I could I could easily see people putting one or two copies of this into a deck that they've loaded up with a ton of barrier, a ton of big fat barriers. I fully expect the outfit to start running this so they can slam down their bulwarks. Res it, gain three from the bad pub they just gained, and effectively install and res a bulwark for two credits. Like this is, yeah, this this will turn this will turn a game around real fast. This will make your scoring remote way scarier very quickly. So this this definitely has the capacity to turn around a game. All right, then we've got too big to fail. This is a four influence zero to play five to trash operation. Play only if you have less than 10 credits, gain 7 credits, and take one bad pub. 
So this is obviously meant to go with the outfit, although it's got solid use in corset Wayland as well. Zero to play, take a bad pub, gain eight, ain't bad. But in the outfit, this is zero to play, gain to gain a bad pub, gain ten. And it's it's trashable, but it's five to trash, so it's not really trashable. But this just uh, serves to feed into Wayland's, as particularly the outfits, just ridiculous amount of burst econ. Like, you thought you were safe from punitive? No, you're not. You thought you were safe from hard-hitting news? No, you're not, because... This is not uh, a terminal. Uh, you can't play more than one because it'll t put you above the 10 credit limit, but you can absolutely just throw the runner's math of what they think they're safe from on its head by quite a bit. The The five to trash is almost feels like it's taunting you because how often is the runner actually going to do that? But this is just a, a massive burst econ card for the outfit to abuse to land punitives and hard-hitting news is are just like you thought they were finally broken. Nope, now they're not. So that's what this that's what this is for. So and it is also a transaction, so it can be played by Brian Stinson, whom the community's opinion on has kind of changed since he came out, shall we say. Here I am, out and about with my boyfriend. I can't remember when I was this happy. I hate him so much! Why do I have to deal with him? Then, last up for Wayland, we've got Under the Bus. This is a one to play, three influence operation. Play only if the runner accessed at least one card during their last turn. Trash one connection resource and take a bad publicity. So obviously, once again, uh, some use in other Wayland identities, but primarily for the outfit because this is a net gain of two credits in order to play this and also blow up a connection. And the runner accessing a card during their last turn is like it. It might as well say have made a run. Uh, the only exception is things where you don't access, like siphon and trashing. This this is by far and away the easiest way to blow up a connection in the game. Like. It just is. I mean, there is there is MC informant, but that's a lot more expensive to use. This is this literally gains you money while just like evil, just telling the connection to go die, and that's what it does. So now, how many connections are relevant against the outfit? I'm not sure. Uh, that's something I'd have to look into a little bit more. I mean, one of the things that comes right at the top of the head, my head is Film Critic, because that's one of my favorite connections. But I don't think that is going to do much to the other. No, it, it turns off Punitive. Film Critic turns off Punitive, so that is actually pretty important to them. Yeah, that's. I think that might be its primary use, is to just murder Film Critic on site. But it's, yeah, it's if you, if you, want, a, it's a, if you want a connection dead, this is the go-to card to use. And... At long last, the very last card in the pack. This is Lady Liberty. This is a 5 to res, 4 to trash, unique asset. It's 1 per deck, so I'm not quite sure why it's unique, because it, you're only allowed to have one in the deck anyway, so that seems kind of redundant. But it says, when your turn begins, place a power counter on it, and three clicks, add an agenda from HQ to your score area worth agenda points equal to the exact number of hosted power counters. So basically this is a like, if you're going to try to use this, it's a late game, fast advance, close out the game tool. I mean the 5 to res is quite steep, but you can have this installed in a server, pay to res it at the start of your turn, put a counter on a count, power counter on it, and then just fast advance a 3-1 out of your hand. And then if, if they can't get into it and trash it that turn, you can, the next turn, fast advance a 4-2 out of your hand. And the next turn, fast advance a 5-3 out of your hand. And, you know, at that point, it doesn't really have any value anymore. And at that point, if you haven't won, then something's really weird. But I think... I, th I think this is going to be... So of course, Unless, of course, you are doing the one thing that I'm sure people will try to do with this, and that's run in government takeover decks where you let this sit out for six turns and you 
try to fast advance government takeover with it. And meanwhile, you're trying to run false flag and you're trying to score government takeover. Like this is this is another tool for people who really like government takeover. Outside of that, it's a, it's a it's a it's a fun little card, and I don't I don't think it's going to see a lot of play, but it could be useful uh, throwing into like especially an asset spam deck because the runner you know doesn't want to have to check it or get through a bunch of ice to get to it every time. It could it could, it could be surprisingly useful as a like one of help close out the game to get that last one or two agenda points kind of thing. So, because you're cause resing this early probably isn't great because the five to res will send you, will hit your tempo a lot. And then it, this sitting out for a long time doesn't do much. It's like the first three turns of this is resed, it's relevant. And after that, it just kind of disappears. So, I don't know. Maybe you'll see this as a, as a little as a little spicy pick in decks now and then just to help just to help close out that game. Also, because I also as a little note, I don't think clot stops this because it says add an agenda from your hand to your score area instead of actually. You know, I don't think it actually. It doesn't use the keyword score, so I don't think clot stops this. So there might be some value in that. All right, everyone, there you have it. That is Rain and Reverie, and that is the final official Netrunner product that we're going to get. And as sad as that is, uh, there are definitely some silver linings to the cloud. For one, this game is far from actually dead. Like, as long as people keep playing it, it will still stay alive and well. And to his very, very great credit, Boggs has not only given us a great product uh, within the revised core set and the Katara cycle and Rain and Reverie, but above all, and one of the most important things is his final gift to us is that we get to leave this game in one of the best, healthiest, and most fun and diverse and interesting metas that I have probably ever seen in any game, card game or otherwise. And that means a massive amount of difference in whether or not the game keeps going after its cancellation or not. And the game, with 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 a game like this interesting and this great and in this amazingly good of a meta, there is no way that it will not keep being played and keep being enjoyed for months and years after it's, after it's been officially stopped. So I have no intention of stopping this game anytime soon. I will keep playing it and I will keep loving it and I hope all you will too. So thank you and good night and always be running.